It's been interesting being on vacation trying to come up with a sermon because I really didn't allot for a lot of time because I was not checked into sermon stuff, but I was more checked into God. I said, okay, what do you want me to talk about? And this week, this, this post in particular came up on our Facebook page and I thought it was so appropriate and God said this, I want you to talk about this. It says, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God didn't put out the fire, he just put Jesus in there with them. It's not about God putting out your fires, it's about who he is in the fire with you. See, far too often, and it may even be the desire of our hearts when we pray, God, take away this situation. And that's okay to pray about, and it's okay to want that. What God sometimes says is, my promises have never been, I will fix everything for you and make life easy, but I will be in it with you. And far too often, the lies we believe is what our emotions tell us is we're alone, we're suffering, we're, we're sunk, we're done. You are defeated, you are useless, you are nothing. And Jesus says, I am everything, I have you, and I love you. And if the God who is bigger than all things, especially our problems, says, I love you so much, I will give all that I am for you to be elevated, to be with me, that's the truth we have to cling to. Amen. But it's easy. As human beings, we, we look at the fire, we don't look at Jesus. You know, and it's... One of those things where I hope that we get this, this sense of hope and the, of the promises that Jesus has. And throughout the scriptures, even before God was called Jesus, even when it was just the Israelites and Yahweh in Joshua 1.9, he says this. And what I love about this, this one is a bit more stern. This is God talking through Joshua to the people. He says, have I not commanded you? That kind of gets your attention when God himself is speaking. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You have to know it. You can't always feel it because our emotions will betray us at the first opportunity to make us feel like we are not going to ever get out of where we are at right now. And I know from experience, sometimes that's not easy to say or know or claim, but we have to choose to do it, and it's our choice whether to or not. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, again, remove the fear. Don't focus on that, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. It's the repetitive motion that, that God is giving. This, listen, I said this before, I'll say it again. Don't be afraid. Don't be focused on what's happening. I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will do for you what you cannot do, what you're afraid of not happening. I will fulfill it. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. No matter what steps the journey, no matter what direction that journey takes you, no matter what decisions you make, good, bad, or indifferent, I am always with you. And Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. He's saying don't look at what you don't have or don't focus on what could be but isn't yet or don't focus on what other people have and you want. Take your mind and focus off of that. He says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. It's this promise time and time again that God says, listen, I don't know what your situation is from my perspective. He does always. And whether or not we're in a situation because of poor choices or not, he says, I will be in it with you. I will never forsake you. I'll never forget you. I'll never leave you. In fact, I'm here with you because I love you. And that takes us to Acts chapter 6 and 7 this morning, which is where I want to go. But a little background on Stephen. Only gave one sermon. He was chosen to be a part of the apostles because they loved his character because of what the Holy Spirit was doing. In fact, Scripture says he was defined as a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And these were the qualities they were looking for. And they said, if he's good enough for God, he's good enough to be a part of our group. In fact, we're going to use him and we're going to do something with him. We want to empower that gift and we don't want to hinder it or make it fit our agenda our desires, we want to set him free to let God do with him what he wants to do with him. Acts chapter 6 says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, before many great wonders and signs amongst the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the Sanhedrin, 
of the freedmen, Jews of the Cyrene and Alexandria as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom of the Spirit that gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we must have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. See, what's interesting is sometimes when, when you're empowered and God is using you on a journey, See, and Stephen was. He was defined as a man full of the Holy Spirit. He was just moving. He was trucking along and nothing could touch him. Even when entire different pockets of your own people who do not believe the same way you do come up against you trying to trip you up in your words, the Spirit is speaking through him with such wisdom and practicality in his faith, they cannot refute what he is saying. But they're still pissed off because he's saying it in the first place. And people get so emotionally attached to whatever beliefs they have, even when you present truth to them sometimes, even if it's a Holy Spirit-inspired truth, they will reject it because it makes them feel uncomfortable with the possibility of leaving where they are now. I, I've seen that and experienced it myself. and It has nothing to do with, with me or my, my journey. It has everything to do with sometimes people in the church in North America don't want to hear about the Holy Spirit because it takes away from the comfortable, secure, routine services that they have made an infrastructure of. When Dad and I were going to a little Anglican church and, and our pastor had to step down and retire because he was going blind, we were without a pastor, and then we got connected with a Lutheran church that had a great congregation, I think it was twice as big as us, and they said, can we use your building for a year or two? It ended up being, I think, closer to three years they were part of our congregation. And their pastor led the services, and we would just combine into one big church until their building was built. Well, in that time, we, we learned very quickly as the Holy Spirit was doing a movement in the Anglican side, the Lutheran side was not so much about that. They were about routine, and it's 11.15, which means it's time for prayer, and it's communion, and it's another prayer, and then we're done. And what their pastor had a hard time doing was letting go of that schedule and routine. I remember one time, the drummer from their worship team who had cancer who could barely hold the brushes, was still up there praising and worshiping, and I felt compelled to lay hands on him and pray as he worshiped. And that led, not because of me, because of the Spirit, into the entire church laying hands on this guy. And there wasn't a physical healing, but there was an emotional one. And as the Spirit was being praised and experienced, because the clock struck a certain time, here comes their pastor and he pushes himself through to the pulpit and he starts delivering a message to empty chairs because everyone is up laying hands on this guy and he speaks to an empty room his pre-recorded words written down and he did not grasp his concept of letting go and letting God. But at times, that's what's going to happen. See, it had nothing to do with the fact that a lot of times, maybe even Stephen wanted, I just want it to be easy. I'm doing what you want. Obviously, this is a train that I'm just on. They can't touch my words because they're not mine, they're yours. They can't argue with what I'm saying. And now they're going to lie in order to try and dissuade who he is and what he's doing. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law and they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place, against the holy law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. They were afraid of their absolute lifting up and worship of the legalistic law rather than the God who gave them the law in the first place and the reason he gave it to them. They weren't focused on God. They were focused on their to-do list that God gave them to do. And they're afraid of a Jesus who we don't believe in in the first place, and a man professing the name of Jesus, saying he's going to destroy the religious routines that we have built. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now, I love this because what we're actually understanding here is the exact same thing that Moses, the one they're accusing Stephen of blaspheming, had the same experience when he came down from the mountain that he had this shining glory that radiated off him, not because of who he was or how good he was, but because who he kept company with. Yeah. 
And here's Stephen having the same moment. The Holy Spirit is in him that people are seeing it physically and not understanding what the heck is going on. And it's funny because they accuse him of blaspheming against Moses. So Stephen gives the one and only sermon of his life. He stands up and gives the entire history of the Old Testament to the people that know it better than he should. And he starts connecting the dots of how we were here and how we fell and how there's always been a promise of a Messiah, a one who will deliver us, and not in the way that you want, but in the way that we need. And then he compares this Moses that they worship and who he actually has reverence for to Jesus. He says, and then came Moses, the one who was actually Christ-like in his walk in the sense of he stood up and identified with people a people that he really didn't have to connect with because he had everything going for him. He was inheriting power over an entire world at that time. And he chooses to identify with the slaves rather than the power. And he goes out and he thinks he's going to be received well and he starts protecting these people by beating the Philistines or the, the, you know, the Pharaoh's people, the, the Egyptians to death, pardon me, who are mistreating these slaves. And he thinks, I'm going to be a cult hero amongst my people and the next day he's rejected by them. He's not welcomed with open arms like he thought he should be. He's rejected and his whole identity is shaken and he runs away for 40 years. See, because times, things don't work out the storybook way we want them to because it's not about how easy it is. It's about how good God is amidst the chaos of our lives and even amidst the opposition that is unjust or unfair. It's not about the fire. It's about who's in it with you. And he continues, and then he says, and then Jesus came. And he says this, you stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors who always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one who you still say is yet to come and you missed it. And now you've betrayed and murdered him and you've received the law that was given through the angels but not obeyed it. And again, at times there's this emotional attachment. You know, it, it amazes me. And not just in the faith circles of life but in every circle of life. When, when people are presented with something that challenges what they believe to be truth, and even if it starts to stir something in them, a lot of times people get angry and defensive, not because of the method that you're presenting it, because it makes them feel uncomfortable with, with the proposition that they may have to change the way they think. Yeah. And our culture is really headed that way. Yeah. You see, Jesus' method was never about condemning, it was about loving and then sharing truth in that love. The woman caught in adultery, again, is the greatest example, I think, that right off the top of my head, because she was caught who could have been stoned and probably should have been because that was according to the law. And they presented this woman to Jesus. She got caught doing something wrong. We set her up, yeah, but it doesn't matter. It does matter. And uh, we want her dead. So what do you say? And Jesus turns it around and puts it back on them to self-reflect. Okay, well, if you're perfect, go ahead. Be the first one. Who has not committed sin amongst you? Feel free to cast the first stone. Right, but I've seen too many times where, where churches operate that way and that's people's experiences. They get stoned rather than saved. See, and Jesus comes up and, and he says, where are all the people who wanted you dead? Where are the people that condemned you? They're not here. I don't either. He shows love and validation. He says, go and sin no more because it's not good for your health. It's not practical, but he doesn't start with that statement. He shows love. Hello? He shows love first. See, the thing about it is, a lot of times, even though Stephen is doing it, not on his own accord, but through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Scripture says that very clearly. It is not received. And we want to hear, no, no, he must have done something wrong because God can never be rejected. Yes, he can, because he doesn't force our wills. And the thing is, they were so emotionally attached to what was. And how they viewed what was was perfect and didn't need changing. A lot of times, especially back then, the religious institution 
professed the coming of a Messiah, but I really don't think they wanted it because the only thing they wanted was to keep the same way they were living just outside of the Roman occupation. And in their eyes, that's the only thing that God could do for them was to remove Rome from being their lords and allow them to be a superpower. And they thought that was perfect. Everything else was completely in check. Where Jesus was more concerned with the heart behind everyone who called themselves religious in the first place. And then they decide, well, let's stone him. Let's kill this guy. You know, I wouldn't exactly call that a successful ending, but the biblical definition of success really has less to do with the outcome as it does the motivation of taking a stance in the first place. See, I would argue... That did it. That's okay. See, Stephen really didn't have what the world would call a successful outcome because he died. But we know that this was a biblically successful outcome because of what happens right now. Because see, Stephen is in the fire. He's facing a lot of people who hate him and the God that he stands for, even though the God that he stands for was working so powerfully in his life, there was healings and miracles before he got elected to the position of being an apostle, and then he's going and talking to the religious elite who try and challenge him with their knowledge and their limited wisdom, and God steps forward and says, no, let me show you the truth, and they are presented the truth, and they reject the truth because it stands in the way of what they want to be truth. And here's Stephen doing the right thing through the right motivation for the right reasons and he's still going to die for it. But he doesn't focus on what he's losing. See, this is what the scripture says. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, still in this moment. And I would be absolutely terrified. I don't fear death, but I fear pain. And being stoned to death and being beaten with a bunch of stones from different angles, slowly beating you to death terrifies me. Or some of the death that the martyrs have faced in the history of the Christian church absolutely terrifies me. But I think that fear was not focused upon, like Scripture said earlier, I think he was focusing upon Jesus because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is what happens, which is the most important moment. He looked up, he looked past the fire that he was in right there, and he looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now why is this important? Because he's actually seeing heaven open up and he's physically seeing, I'm convinced, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now why is this important? Because all throughout the history of the Old Testament scripture and the Jewish tradition, the Messiah will be at the right hand. But all throughout scripture he'll be seated because he's represented as this, this royal, untouchable savior of all who deserves glory. Why is Jesus standing? Because he's in the fire with Stephen. Stephen is given this blessing to be able to see it. If there's Jesus who cares enough for me and in my moment of absolute suffering and need, he is standing, intervening on my behalf. He's not fixing it, but he's with me, comforting me as I go. And he says, look, again, he's not focused on the stones that are about to rain down. I see heaven open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And you can tell that that God had changed who he was because listen to his response here. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said that, he fell asleep because he's remembering the words of Jesus, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And from a human standpoint, I would have been emotionally compromised and condemning and say, Lord, kill these, pardon the expression, these bastards for what they're doing to me and the injustice that's coming upon me. He doesn't say that. He says, Lord, forgive them. Don't put this condemnation on them. He's saying basically, Lord, let them experience your grace and your love. Not because they deserve it, because they don't and they need it. What's most important about this, and I want you to know this, no matter what you're going through now, no matter where you're at in life right now, The person that holds the coats of everyone who's doing the stoning, his name is Saul, young man. Saul becomes one of the greatest persecutors of the church 
and also becomes the greatest expander of the church when he has this encounter with Jesus Christ and has his name changed from Saul to Paul. This is Saul's first encounter with the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ. I'm going to go out on a limb and say because I believe because of this experience he was able to have his own encounter later on on that road. If not for this moment, and what I mean by that is no matter what you're going through right now, even if it doesn't end the way you want it to, but Jesus is in it with you and you are seeking him and he's empowering you, and it may even rob us of all things that aren't fair, that aren't right, Jesus might have a life-changing impact on someone who's being unjust to you right now or people who are observing you that have nothing to do with Christ right now and change their lives because of your example. Because Jesus never promises, I will take you out of the fire, but I will be in it with you. Next week we are, uh, I talked a while ago about having a baptism this month. And it's been a couple of weeks because I wasn't here last week. The week before that we had stampede breakfast, which is really cool. The week before that I might have mentioned it, but when time goes by people forget I had Chantel message me and she says, you know, I'm really looking forward to getting baptized next week. I want to do that. I haven't mentioned this in weeks, but she's been obviously thinking about this. She's, and she was wrestling for weeks with this understanding, this concept. Can I be baptized again? Because I was baptized as a child and it really wasn't what I wanted at the time. But I thought it was the right thing to do because of my family and the upbringing I was a part of. But I really want it for me now. Can I do that again? I said, Yes. See, what water baptism is, it, it, it's, it's a symbolic gesture of, of what Jesus is and who you are in Christ. You're stepping into a watery grave, being washed clean by the water, dying to the old self and resurrecting as you step back out. I know this phase all too well. I do that every time it's time to get up in the morning. Yep. Well... I keep trying to ask Mel to change my diaper. She keeps declining. I'm like, come on. But what Chantal was really wrestling with is this idea of, I want to make a stand for me, for my journey. See, her testimony about this place has always been, you know, these, these people, even though I've called myself a Christian, I've never really fully connected to Jesus. I've never had a relationship. I wouldn't even call myself a believer of Jesus. I would just call myself a Christian because that's what she did. She would tell me that sometimes this place is the place that's allowed her to journey that comfortably, receptively. So I don't know what's going to happen next week. If it's just her that gets baptized, great. But if, if there's other people that come or that are here and want to get baptized, it's going to be spontaneous. You want to go in the water, let's go in the water. <laughs> hey, I was in Penticton. That's not bad. It's still a little cold, but there's not much here that's going to be warmer than that, so I'm out. Because <laughs> I'm the one who's going to be in it the longest. <laughs> but... All that to say, I, I, I don't know if this spoke to anyone, but I really think that we probably could have just shown that first slide. Let's go back to that if you don't mind, Steve. And that would have been enough for the week. I, I don't know. Steve, did you post this one? Angie did. Thank you. Because it was so important for this to be heard and received, I think. I think that encouraging message that it doesn't matter in the sense not to devalue where you're at, but the fire is not going to end you or define you. That Jesus in the fire will. So if that's the message for anyone here or anyone listening, receive it and own it. Because there's something so powerful about his love and his reception. And it will be interesting to see what happens next week. So God, we give you this time. We thank you for this morning. Lord, I pray that your message and your words get spoken in the way that's appropriate for what you want, not for what I want. And again, we, we pray for the direction of this church and this body and who we're going to become and how we're going to get there. We just pray that you lead it and let us be receptive to it.
You have the wisdom and discernment to be able to get there, Lord God. And I lift up everyone here who needs to be lifted up for their specific needs, whether the physical, Lord, for my brother, whether emotional, like I know there's so many people here this morning. I just pray for a spiritual posture of reception to receive it, Lord God, that you will touch who we are and continue to nurture and change us into who you want us to be. That people be able to experience you and see your glory shining through our lives and the way that you touch our motivations, our speech, and our actions, Lord God. And I pray this will be a safe place for people to journey in their confusion, their misunderstanding of their faith, and maybe even no faith at all, but people will come and be welcomed and supported and just, as Derwin says, dance so close to the river they can't help but fall in. God, I thank you for a community that just is healing to be present in because you're here. Lord, I just pray for every ministry that's taking place. Lord, I pray for Danielle. I don't know what state she's at with the baby, but she's ready to pop soon. I pray for health, Lord, and safety over her and the baby. I pray for healthy rhythms to be established at home, that they will be able to find themselves in that. Lord, I pray for Steve and Angie as they prepare to journey out for a while, that you'll give them safe, Lord, and help them have a great time with family. Lord, and again, no matter where we're at, any other situations, remind us that you're in it with us, and that you've not forsaken us, that we are not forgotten, that we are not lost or defeated. We're just in a moment. Lord, and you are still God, and use people in those moments, Lord, to inspire, to uplift this community and others outside of it, that we can be your hands and your feet, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.